so good to have a full team here. We've got Mark back, we've got Cricket on the piano, and Bill and Jennifer up here singing. It's nice to be growing a team, and if anybody else is interested... Children or grandchildren or neighborhood kids at home, 
that you would like to give an activity sheet to, just feel free to raise your hand. I'll come around and pass those out to you. And if there's anybody, I'll do that in just a moment. Wonderful. All right. So yeah, just continue to be praying for our children. We are praying for them, especially as they're going through this difficult transition, going back to school amidst everything going on. So praying for them and praying for our community. Thank you all so much. Water, praise the Lord. Amen. <laughs> Beautiful day he's given us. Scripture today, Matthew 13, short two verses, 52 and 53. Then he said to them, Therefore every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out of his treasure things new and old. Now it came to pass, when Jesus had finished these parables, that he departed from there. So I don't forget, uh, Breakwater family, um, I want to lift up Mike Curry husband of Kim Curry who comes on Wednesday night who is in the hospital and has requested our prayers for him so please remember Mike Curry in your daily prayers let us go to the Lord what a privilege our dearest Heavenly Father we come to you today number one because we love you but we come collectively today as fellow Christians to praise your holy name that you so deserve to glorify you and to honor you. We rejoice in knowing that you are all-powerful, all-knowing, and that you are ever-present, that you are an active, living God who is working all things out for good to those who are called according to his purpose and to who love him. You never sleep and you never get weary. Thank you, Lord, for us knowing that. Lord, as spiritual beings, we are partners with you. You are fighting our battles in the heavenly realms and here with us on earth on our behalf. Lord, it is our part with you to just stir up our faith because Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So hope Father, is what our faith is standing on. Hope is a powerful thing. Don't let the devil ever steal that away from us, Lord. Help us to stay and believe that something good is going to happen to us today on our way home, tonight, tomorrow. Speak life to us. Father, through the Holy Spirit, call us daily into reading your word. It is our guidebook to life and how to face and conquer our fears and our questions. Help us to live your way to reap good benefits. Your word, Father, shapes our attitudes and our daily emotions. Help us to focus on your promises, to thank you for blessing and still working miracles in our lives. Yes, Father, these are challenging days but we confess, Lord, that with God, all things are possible. Now, Father, we joyfully lift up our pastor, our beloved Pastor Roger, to you, Father. And we just ask that you anoint him, use him as your holy vessel this day to speak the words that you know we need to hear, to encourage us, strengthen us, clarify your word, and just walk beside us. So, Lord, we lift him up and we just praise you for all that you do. We love you, Lord, and this way prayer we lift to you in your powerful and beautiful name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Greetings, mighty warriors. Greetings, Greetings Breakwater family. I tell you, it doesn't get any better than this, does it? You know, Woo! ocean view, palm trees, sunshine, breeze. breeze. It's beautiful. Flowers. Look at uh, what a wonderful opportunity to uh, worship God in spirit and truth and to those of you who are online, uh, we're praying for you today. We love you, and uh, we're waiting for this virus to get behind us so we can yeah. all come together again. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Um, before I get to the uh, sermon this morning, I had a couple of announcements. Uh, the, the first one is uh, called Operation Blessing, and we're, we're partnering with the uh, Oceanside Rotary Club, 
and they've, they've identified that some of the hardest hit people uh, dealing with this virus are those who are in uh, assisted living retirement communities. And so the Rotary Club and us have adopted uh, two uh, assisted living care facilities. One is uh, Brookdale Senior Living Center right here in Oceanside, and the other is uh, Chateau Lake San Marcos. Uh, Brookdale's pretty large. They have 60 to 70 residents, and they wouldn't give us names or anything like that, but um, generic, um, generic cards are well appreciated. You know, hello, how's it going? Tell a little bit about yourself. And uh, they, they take these cards and they, and they uh, give them to them on their breakfast trays. And so sometimes that's the only communication they get. Families can't visit, friends can't visit. Most of the folks that are in assisted living facilities don't have computer skills, so they can't uh, uh, communicate electronically. So um, uh, over there, there's some card stock if you want to make your own cards. Uh, we have a goal of uh, having a lot of letters back by September 6th. You can put them in the basket over there. Uh, the, the other club, Chateau Lake San Marcos, they only have six residents, and they gave us the names and some of their, some of their interests. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the names and, and the, the interests that they have, and if that strikes you and you want to write to them, just raise your hand and Brady or Megan going to hand this to you. There's Linda, who's a university teacher. Okay, you got that one? All right, I can reach you there. All right. Then there's Julia, who lived a number of years in Canada. Used to play tennis, love, loves cats. Anybody want that one? Cats. We got second service too. So <laughs> then there's Don from the East Coast who loves baseball. Anybody want to write to Don? And then we have Elaine. She's described as a girly girl, loves bling, plants, and flowers. Anybody want to write to? We got one there, Kathy. Okay. The bling, the, the bling girl. And then Mary likes cards and games, flowers and plants. Anybody want to write to Mary? Here's, there's one over there, Trish. Yay, Trish. And then uh, Betty loves cats, plants, and flowers. Anybody want to write? All right, Christina, there you go. Thank you. All right, so well, well, you, took, you took four out of the six, so we'll leave a couple for second service. And uh, other ways we can help Chateau San Marcos if you feel led. Uh, they, the, the residents have sliding doors to the outside, so potted plants are welcome. If you want to, uh, you know, you can bring potted plants here and we'll get them to the facility. Uh, they, uh, they also like donut drop-offs. They don't get donuts and stuff like that. So, so both the staff and the residents like donuts. If you ever want to deliver donuts, talk to me. They like crafty uh, painted beach rocks with inspiring words on them. Uh, most, most of the residents wear clothing protectors when they eat. The director says, I hate the word bibs. So if any of you ladies that sew, we could use some colorful clothing protectors. And then she says, thanks so much for adopting us. So that's a real good ministry as we go forward, especially uh, during these difficult times. The second announcement is um, on September 6th, we're going to have a beach baptism. We have two friends of the breakwater community that have requested a baptism and so we'll have our two outdoor services here and normally when we have baptisms big extravaganzas and food on the beach and everything else uh, we won't be having the food this year but we will uh, we'll we'll sing a song or two we'll read the scripture uh, be a little bit of testimony and we'll have the baptisms on the beach following the second service tyson street beach uh, park the, the beach right there and if you know of anybody else that's ready to be baptized, you know, let me know and we can, uh, we can make that happen. So just a couple quick announcements. Um, Jesus said, uh, therefore, uh, teachers of the law who have been instructed in the ways of the kingdom are like uh, homeowners that bring out uh, something new and something old from the storehouse of their home. And so I, I brought this in today. Does anybody know what this is? Slide rule. Slide That's a slide rule. Um, this was invented in 1622. Woo. But I, how many of you used a slide rule at some point? Okay, quite a few. Paul, you did too, huh? All right. How many, how many have never even heard of a slide rule? Not oh, look at this. Half have never even heard of a slide rule. But when I was in high school 100 years ago, 
we, uh, we, we did everything with the slide rule. You can multiply on this, you could divide on this, you could figure out logarithms, square roots, squares, all trigonometry, you could do it all on there. I forgot everything. But, uh, but this, this was it. Ma everything in math, everything in physics, we, we used the slide rule. This, this comes actually from the storehouse of Don Kaiser and his old, his old treasures in his storehouse. And Don still knows how to use it. So. But, um, um, so like back, back when I was in high school, we used that. And we had, we, calculators were just coming out, you know, Hewlett Packard. And uh, we had one room in the school where there was a, 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 ch a child's desk, that's all that was in there, and there was a calculator on that desk. And if you behaved yourself when you were in high school, the teacher might allow you to go into that room and play with that calculator. Uh, and, uh, but, but to use a calculator in math or science was cheating back when, back when I was in high school. And they, they were coming out with computers in those days, but the computers were uh, entire rooms. The, the computer filled up an entire room, and our school didn't have one. But I traveled, we, I was part of the computer club, and we traveled uh, 20 miles to a local school so that we could use their computer. And they were teaching us how to program the computer. And in order to program the computer, you had to fill out these 3 by 8 inch cards with a number 2 pencil. And to, to make some, a very simple program, you had to fill out a stack of cards about that high, you know, three or, four, 3 or 4 inches high. And you'd hand it in to the guy that ran the computer. And you know, the, during the week, he'd run he'd run your cards through the computer, and you come back the following week, and he would say, "Well, it didn't work. You had an error on one of these cards," and he'd hand that whole stack of cards back, and you had to figure out where they. And I got tired of it, you know. But uh, now, holy cow! Now everything is on this. That's right. Everything's on an iPhone. You can calculate anything here, and so this is something new, something far better than, than the slide rule. And if, you know, and, and if you try to stick with the slide rule in, the, in this digital era, you're not going to keep up. You know, this is, it's new, it's better, but it was built on the foundation of the slide rule that was invented in 1622. You know, there's also a telephone. You know, and Alexander Graham Bell uh, invented the telephone in the, in the 1800s. And I guess the first words were, Watson, come and help me. And the, the myth is he spilled acid on himself or something, but those are the first words that were ever spoken on a telephone in the 1800s, come, come and help me. And again, I'm telling stories, but when I grew up as a kid, we had a party line and we had a phone hanging on the wall. And, uh, to, and to call somebody, uh, if I wanted to call Paul Heider, I'd pick up the phone and say, operator, give me one, two, three. You know, that would be Paul's telephone number, and then I could talk to Paul, and everybody in the neighborhood would listen on the line. I still remember our telephone number was 229. And so if I went to uh, visit somebody and wanted to call my mom, I'd pick up the phone and say, Operator, 229. Well, we don't need to do that anymore. We got, we got these, something new, an improvement on the old. I still suspect everybody listens in, even when you talk on these, though, too. Or think about uh, the airline industry. How many of you have been to the... Air and Space Museum at Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. If you haven't been there, put that on your bucket list because at the Air and Space Museum at the Smithsonian in, in Washington, D.C., they have the original uh, Wright Brothers flying machine made out of bicycle parts. 1903, Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. Bicycle parts taken off and flying along the beach. That's first, first the beginnings of of aviation. Uh, the lunar command module of the Apollo 11 that, uh, that landed on the moon, or that circulated the moon, uh, in 1969. And so in 66 short years, you're going from bicycle parts of flying 100 feet in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, to landing somebody on the moon. Isn't that incredible? The new building on the old. The new is better. Than, now it's space shuttles. And, you know, the space shuttles have taken us to international space stations and astronauts are staying in space for a year or more. And I suspect we'll be, we'll be going to further parts of our, of our solar system as, uh, as, as time progresses. But, uh, 
this is what Jesus is talking about uh, in 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 the warehouse. Uh, somebody somebody who um, is is a teacher of the law uh, that's been instructed in the ways of, of God's kingdom is is like a store owner that takes out some old things, you know, maybe like the slide rule, and then brings out uh, brings out a new thing like the the iPhone and. Uh, the old and the new are both woven together in such a way that neither could stand without the other. Uh, Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, he says, I have not come to destroy the law, I've come to fulfill the law, Matthew 5, 17. And you look at your faith, and without the newness of, of God's message through Jesus Christ, our faith is like a museum piece. It's not all that valuable. But without the old, you know, the laws of Moses and the prophets from the Old Testament, uh, our faith is built on a constantly shifting foundation that offers no stability. And so we want both old and new in our house. How many of you have uh, things in your home that remind you of your mom or your dad or your grandparents? You know, those are the old things. And then you bring new things into that house as well. And both the old and the new reflect the good news of Jesus Christ, which is, which is why when we sing, I, I encourage that we sing some of the old hymns, uh, you know, to not lose sight of the past, and allow for creativity and allow some, some new stuff which is why in our services sometimes uh, we might read the Lord's Prayer together or say it together or read the Apostles' Creed together or say the Ten Commandments, uh, something old. But then we also encourage those extemporaneous prayers and, ex and, and creative ways of sharing your faith with others without exactly quoting Scripture. Something old, something new, it's all good. And so as Matthew writes this, how many did the readings this week? Matthew 9 through 13. Not too many hands today, Matthew 9. So next, but as Matthew writes, he's, uh, he's, he's dealing with new things that Jesus taught, and he's, he's uh, basing it on old things that we read uh, in, in the Old Testament. And Jesus uh, brings a teaching that is entirely new. You know, the Old Testament said, love your neighbor. You know, Jesus says, love your enemy. You know, and that's a lot deeper. Some people would say that's the same person, but usually there's a usually there's a distinction. But it's a new teaching. You know, we're called to love our enemy, which is a tough challenge. You know, that's that's the newness of God's kingdom. Uh, Jesus brings us a community that's new. In the Old Testament, uh, it was Israel was the chosen nation, but this new community is far bigger. You know, Jesus is uh, he's inviting tax collectors and zealots to be part of his band. He's inviting prostitutes and princes. He's inviting uh, Romans. He's inviting uh, Samaritans. He's inviting Jews. He's inviting an international community. It's a new community. It's a greater community. It's a better community. Uh, Jesus brings a, a mission that is new. The Old Testament mission was Israel as the holy nation. The, the New Testament message that Jesus brings, Matthew 28, go into all the world and make disciples of every nation, uh, teaching them everything I've commanded you and baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's a greater, a newer, a better mission, the whole world. And as Matthew continues to tell the story of Jesus, he's uh, reminding us of Moses. And he's saying, Moses gave us the foundation, but Je the message of Jesus is newer and greater. You know, the, the, the birth of Moses was pretty spectacular. You remember his birth, Exodus chapter 2. You know, there were too many Israelites in Egypt, and so Pharaoh, the wicked king of Egypt, decided he's going to kill all the male babies. And so the, so the, the mother of Moses uh, took him and put him in a basket and floated them down the Nile River. And who finds baby Moses but the daughter of Pharaoh? And says, oh, isn't he cute? And pulls him out of the water and raises Moses in, in the home of, uh, of Pharaoh. So, uh, but, but Matthew is saying the birth of Jesus 
was even more spectacular. You know, there was a second pharaoh, a wicked Herod, who wanted to kill all of the baby boys that were being born in Bethlehem because he was afraid there was a there was a, a, a another king coming. And so and so uh, uh, Matthew tells us that there was a virgin who conceived and she gave birth to a son and his name was called Emmanuel. God is with us. The birth of Jesus newer and greater even than the birth of Moses. Uh, Matthew tells us that that Moses, that Jesus was a greater lawgiver than than Jesus. If you think of Exodus 20, Moses goes up to Mount Sinai. God descends upon the mountain and gives Moses the Ten Commandments. But Matthew tells us that Jesus ascended the Mount of Beatitudes and uh, began to teach. And he and he said it was written a long time ago. You know Moses wrote, you know thou shalt not murder. But I tell you. Uh, you shall not have hatred in your heart. And, it, and Jesus takes us deeper with the laws. You know, you, you work on your lust. Work on your giving. Uh, work on keeping your word and honoring your word and so many other teachings. Uh, Matthew tells us that, that Jesus was a greater, a newer and greater deliverer than Moses. And you think of Moses leads the Israelites out of Egypt, out of a land of bondage, crosses through the waters of the Red Sea, and the armies of Pharaoh chasing close behind, and the armies of Pharaoh, the enemy, are destroyed by the collapsing water, and Moses ultimately brings his people to the Promised Land. But Matthew tells us of a greater deliverer. He tells us of Jesus, the Messiah, who destroyed the power of sin in our lives, and ultimately he is the one who has crushed the serpent's head, and, and the promise is that the devil and all of his angels will be headed for the lake of fire at the end of time. So Jesus is a greater deliverer. And the death of Jesus was even greater than the death of Moses. Deuteronomy uh, chapter 34 tells us that Moses lived to be 120 years old. And he died in the land of Moab overlooking uh, the promised land. And nobody knows where he was buried. But Matthew tells us Jesus died in Jerusalem, and we know where his tomb was, but the tomb was empty. Jesus rose from the dead. He destroyed the power of death, conquered death. So, so even the death of Jesus is, is greater than Moses. And so Matthew points these, out, these things out continually in his gospel, how our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is far greater and a newer message than even that of Moses of the Old Testament. As you uh, read through the Gospel of Matthew, uh, the astute reader will notice that it's divided into five sections. And, and each of the sections ends with, after Jesus said these things, he went on and did something else. It's divided into five very clear sections just as the law of Moses is divided into five sections, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Uh, chapter 7, verse 28 of Matthew, after Jesus finished the Sermon on the Mount, it says, after he finished saying these things, he descended, he descended from the mountain, and the people marveled at, at the authority that he has. In chapter uh, 11, verse 1, after Jesus finished teaching what leaders in God's kingdom look like. You know, we're not to be afraid. Uh, we're to shake the dust off of our feet if we're not welcome in any particular town. Uh, the Holy Spirit will give us the words to say if we're, if we're wondering what to say. After Jesus finished instructing, after he finished saying those things, uh, he, he went into the towns of Galilee. Uh, chapter uh, 13, uh, verse 52 that we're looking at today, verse 53, uh, after Jesus finished telling the parables, he left from there and went to his hometown. Uh, in, in Matthew chapter 19, verse 1, Jesus had finished teaching about the greatness and the forgiveness that's found in, in the church and in, and in God's kingdom. And it says, after he finished saying these things, he went to the country of Judea. And then finally, in Matthew chapter 26, verse 1, after he finished teaching about the return of the king, how he's coming back, uh, how he's coming back suddenly, how we don't know when he's coming back, 
uh, how we need to be ready. After he finished saying those things, he turned to his disciples and said, The time of Passover is here, and now it's time for the Son of Man to be crucified. And so Matthew's Gospel, just like the law, law of Moses, is divided into five sections. The center section, what we did today, Parables of the Kingdom, uh, chapter 13, is probably the most poignant about uh, something new. It's built on the back of something old, but it's far better. And Jesus tells seven parables, and I could give a sermon on each one, and I've already done that. But uh, I'll just touch, touch some highlights here today. Uh, the first sermon he gives is the parable of the sower. You know, the sower goes out and, and scattered seeds. And, and back in the day of Jesus, they scattered the seed first, and then they plowed. Uh, and so we do it differently today. We plow, and then we scatter. The, that's why when you read that story, some of the seed went on the grass, and some went among the weeds. There's no weeds there, Gail. And some... And some <laughs> And some went on the road, and on the stone, and some went on good soil, and then they plowed it under. But as you read this parable, Jesus is saying, uh, "That's the old way. That's the old way. The new way is before the farmer even get a chance to plow, uh, the seeds are germinating and sprouting and growing." And Jesus is saying, "The kingdom is already here. You know what are you going to do about it?" So that's that's the first of those seven parables. The second one is the parable of the. Uh, of the weeds, you know, and, and there's always evil people in the world. There were evil people back in Jesus' day. There's evil today. And as Jesus tells the parable, you know, the farmer went out and scattered wheat, and then that very night uh, the enemy went out and threw weeds into that field, and the farmers wanted to rip out the weeds right away. And the message of God's kingdom is, is God's going to judge. You know, don't, don't let evil tear you down because ultimately uh, God is a God of justice and he's going he's to bring justice and, and peace to those who honor him. I think the third parable was the parable of the mustard seed. And we got darn mustard all over our property, a little tiny seed that grows into a nasty looking weed. You get mustard from it and some other condiments. But uh, as Jesus tells it, this mustard seed turns into a giant tree, you know, like these pines and the birds of the air are nesting in its branches. Huge, explosive growth of God's kingdom. The old way is a little bit of growth, but the new, the newness of God's kingdom through Jesus Christ is enormous. And same with the parable of the yeast. You know, a woman took a little bit of yeast and it says she put it into 22 liters of flour. You know, that's... No woman in that day did that. The ladies would get up in the morning and they'd bake a couple loaves of bread for their family. But as Jesus tells this parable, this woman was baking about a hundred loaves of bread, enough to feed the entire community. That's what the kingdom of heaven is like. It's explosive all over the place. You can't, you can't contain it. He tells the kingdom of heaven is like the man uh, walking along and, and discovers a, a treasure buried in the field and he he finds it and he sells everything he has in order to have that treasure. And I know in my own life, I didn't, I wasn't really looking for spiritual things. I wasn't looking, I wasn't desiring to be religious or anything. I'm just kind of bumbling along in life. And all of a sudden I encounter this, the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And yes, this is it. And I sold everything to buy that. I, I changed my career. To, to bring this good news of Jesus Christ. He tells the parable of the, the merchant looking for the pearl of great, looking all sorts of spiritual directions. And it, it might be the environmental movement, or it might be veganism, or some other kind of ism or that. And then they find Jesus. And this, this, is, this is the pearl greater than all of these other things. And the last of those parables was the parable of the net. The net sweeps through and... And again, that reality, there's evil in our world, and we swim alongside the evil until the day of judgment. So each of these parables that Jesus tells us was built on the back of something old, but uh, Jesus brings new life to it, and the new is far better uh, than the old ever was. Are you with me so far? Yep. So the greatest, the greatest change happens in the human heart. You know, when the... We're, we're born in sin, as the Bible tells us. We're born with a sinful nature, but we're born with a personality. We're born with gifts and abilities. We're, 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 we're born with a spiritual thirst. 
You know, we're looking for truth. We're looking for, for meaning in our lives. And when the Spirit of God gets a hold of you, when Jesus Christ gets a hold of your life, as 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, If anyone's in Christ, he's a new creature, a new creation. All things have become new. Old things have passed away. And so when you enter into that relationship with Jesus Christ as the Son of God, and you realize the forgiveness that He offers to you, He takes your personality and, and transforms it, just like that little bit of yeast transformed all of that flour and exploded it and fed the, fed the whole community. God will take your personality as a Christian and touch the lives of scores of people around you with the greatest message in the world. Jesus takes your gifts and abilities that you were born with, your, your right brain or your left brain or however you were wired when you were born, and just like that little mustard seed that explodes into a giant tree with the birds of the air resting in its branches, your gifts and your abilities as a Christian uh, just touches people and gives meaning and purpose to their lives and hope. Uh, to people in the human community. And we need that now, don't we? You know, the hope that the gospel brings. And, uh, you know, God takes that search for meaning. You know, why am I here? You know, what, what's life all about? What should I be doing? He takes those that innate philosophical questions that we all ask, and he presents to us the kingdom of heaven. You know, whether it's we stumble upon it like that guy found it in the field or whether we're looking for it. When we come across uh, Jesus Christ, all of a sudden we realize the purpose. The harvest is here already and uh, the laborers are few and God is calling us into that harvest, harvest to, to share the greatest message in the world. So God takes our lives and totally transforms it. He takes something old and makes something, he doesn't throw out the old, he still uses the personality and the gift and so forth, but he takes it and transforms it and blesses you. And, it, and, it, and it's, a, it's a wonderful walk, walking with the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, I think it was in the 1800s or something, there was this poem that was uh, written uh, for uh, brides on their, on their wedding, wedding day. And, uh, and, and it, was, it, was, it was a poem to tell the bride what she should wear. And you've heard this poem. Something old, something new, something borrowed, borrowed something blue. blue. And then the last line says, a sixpence for her shoe. That was the last part of it. And uh, so the bride traditionally wears something old. You know, something that... Uh, Grandma might have wore on her wedding day, or great-grandma maybe passed along. And she wears something new, you know, something that identifies who she is. And she wears something borrowed. You know, she might have a good friend who's had a happy and successful marriage, and will borrow something from her. She might wear something blue. Uh, blue is a symbol of fidelity, and you want fidelity in, in one's marriage. And then a sixpence for her shoe was a symbol of the prosperity that was a, a prayer for that marriage, that they would prosper and be blessed. Well, you know, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are the bride of Christ. Uh, as, as followers of Jesus, we're the bride of Christ, and we tap into the old. We tap into the laws of Moses and the prophets, and, and we appreciate that. But we also tap into the new and the teachings of Jesus, and the teachings of God's kingdom, and the idea of, of loving our enemy, and the, God, and the idea of a whole community of the entire world as, as servants of the true and the living God. Uh, we, we tap into something borrowed. You know, many of us have had uh, friends and family that have gone before us that live, live exemplary Christian lives, and we take something from their lives and bring them into our own. Uh, we, uh, we, we take on something blue. We want to be faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. No matter, no matter what the issues, no matter what the drama, no matter what the diseases that are floating around, no matter what the politics, you want to be faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. And finally, uh, a sixpence for the shoe. You know, we, He prospers us. 
when you place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, He totally prospers you. He blesses you. He gives you meaning and, and purpose uh, for your life. So some of us are uh, what we call innovatophobia. Uh, we, we're afraid of anything new. You know, you can't move the piano one inch or somebody's going to complain about it or we've always done it this way before. Uh, some people are uh, a traditiophobia, where they're, everything's got to be new all the time, you know, and, and you're afraid that something from the past might impact you in the present. But uh, we are, we take both, you know, as, as the followers of Jesus, something old, something new, something borrowed, something blue, a sixpence for your shoe. Um, you know, we, we appreciate the slide rule that's been around for 400 years, but uh, this isn't going to be too helpful in a digital age, an analog, analogic machine, but, uh, uh, but uh, we appreciate uh, the effort that went into this, and we wouldn't have uh, uh, the iPhone without the, without the slide rule. So, uh, love the Lord Jesus Christ. He uh, transforms you. He makes all things new. He takes the old and blesses and, and gives you peace and meaning and purpose for life. Amen? Amen. Good? All right, let's, uh, let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the message of the kingdom of God. Uh, we know that you have always loved your people throughout the ages, uh, but we didn't always get it. But So we thank you for sending your Son into this world, and we thank you for his teachings, his teachings of grace, and his teachings of the greatness of your kingdom. And we thank you that you laid down your life for us, Lord, and you destroyed the enemy, you destroyed sin, you destroyed death, you destroyed hell, and you offer a new and transformative life to anyone who would call on your name. So this morning, as we close our eyes and open our hearts, maybe there's somebody here today that needs to make a decision to follow Jesus Christ. You've never made that decision before, and it's time. It's time to be that new person, to have that new, renewed personality, to have those charged up gifts and abilities that God's given you. Anybody need to make that decision? So, Lord, again, uh, thank you for being our king and being our God, and thank you for making all things new through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen and amen. This is for all the saints. So feel free to 
hang around a little bit. Uh, we have some uh, hot coffee back there and cold water. Uh, Maddie's back there. Wave your hand, Maddie. She'll help you out. And got some pastries, I think, too, sealed pastries, so they're, they're safe. Uh, we have a donation box uh, right over there. If you'd like to contribute to the ministries of Breakwater Community Church, uh, you can put your gifts in the box or you can donate online. We also have prayer cards uh, back where, where Maddie is as well. If you're new to us, we'd love to have your email address and send you some information about the church. Or if you have prayer requests, uh, put them on those cards and we'll, we'll, be sure to, uh, we'll be sure to pray. And don't forget, there's card stock there if you'd like to write some letters to uh, some of the folks at the Brookdale Senior Living Center. So uh, thanks for coming and joining us today. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen and amen. amen. Thank you.